When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. So Lord, we thank you that you are the one who is stronger than the strong man. The devil has been defeated. Death has been defeated. He tries to hold on to our stuff, but you said no, because you are stronger than the strong man. You come in and you overtake him, and you, when you overcome him, you take from him all the armor in which he trusted, and you divide the spoils with us. So we have our arms open to receive all the spoils that you want to divide with us, and we receive that promise that you are stronger than the strong man today in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. So um, hopefully this will be a, a nourishing meal for you because it really was for me. And, you know, it's just so good to go back and give thanks to the Lord for everything he's done for you. And after you've been a Christian a long time, you don't always think to, to give thanks for basic things because it's easy to take things for granted. But if you've been delivered from an addiction like smoking cigarettes and, you know, so many things that the enemy uses to kill people, uh, if you've been delivered from that by the Lord, it's so good to just keep reminding yourself, without him, where would I be? If it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? And, you know, the context of this little portion, these are just three verses from Luke 11. But Jesus was doing miracles, and the Pharisees were really challenged by that. You would have thought they would have been happy to see people getting free. But they couldn't process the fact that he didn't have the standing, the academic standing and all the training. He was a blue collar guy. He was, he was a carpenter. And yet he was operating in miracles. And, and it says, you know, there's this telling phrase earlier in this chapter that I didn't put on here. But you probably know the Bible well enough to know. It says that he was casting out a demon and it was mute. Okay. And he cast out the demon and the man spoke. So that was a difficult thing for the Pharisees and the religious people because it was a physical problem that had a spiritual root. So there's another portion of scripture in Matthew that I talked about a couple of weeks ago where Jesus uh, is talking to the apostles and they're a little confused and they're saying, why do you keep talking in parables all the time? It's confusing. Wouldn't it be easier to just say what you want to say? And he said, no, it's been given to you to know. Do you remember this? It's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Okay, now they're apostles and I mean, they're, they're blue collar people as well. And in another portion of Matthew, it says he's talking to the Pharisees and it says the tax collectors and the prostitutes are getting into the kingdom ahead of you. Yeah. Wow. That's like not the soft little pleasant Jesus that everybody pictures. And why would that be? Because religion can close your vision off and give you a hardened heart. And all of a sudden now, if, if Jesus couldn't fit in their box, the conclusion they came to in Luke 11 is, oh, well, he cast out that mute devil, but it's by the devil he cast out the devil. And Jesus was like, just think about common sense here for a minute, guys. Like, that doesn't even make sense. No kingdom divided against itself can stand. If the devil casts out the devil, that's not his mission. He's not going to cast himself out. But if I cast out a demon with the finger of God, I have a feeling it was just a little pinky finger, just a little pinky finger of God. His power is so much stronger. And that's what it says. Look, the strong man, I could just picture like this big dude, strong man with his arms up and holding you or me captive in that addiction. In my case, I keep talking about that because that was the one that's most obvious to me. And the one that was just so life-destroying, it was going to kill me if, if I didn't stop. And I tried everything and nothing worked, which is really a frustrating. That makes you more depressed and that makes you use drugs even more. So I was really spiraling, badly spiraling down. And if the Lord hadn't come in, I don't think I'd still be alive. And I was not only, it wasn't just the drugs, it's the behavior that being high led to the stupid things that I was doing that many people have been killed for what I was doing. You could read about it. And it was just the grace of God that spared me. Okay, so here's this thing that happens. And this man that couldn't speak miraculously can speak. 
And religion says, no, that's the devil. You see, you see how dangerous religious thinking can be. It's rigor mortis. It's dead. It's stiff. And nothing live can go in there because it's already decided that can't be God because it doesn't fit in my little box. And Jesus is talking to these blue-collar guys that said, to you has been given to know, know the mysteries of the kingdom. And to the Pharisees, it says, the tax collectors and the harlots are getting in ahead of you. Really big warning, isn't it? And that's how I think we should look at our lives, that we are not just here to fill a pew until Jesus comes back. That we have a mission and we have a call in our lives and every one of us is different. But we should find out what it is and we should try to flourish in that specific call that he has on each one of us. Now, what's really cool to me is this, uh, this analogy of uh, Jesus being stronger than the strong man. Anybody heard of the screw tape letters? Okay, and it's a little bit of a hard read. C.S. Lewis in general is a little bit of a hard read. Um, but this particular one that I have up here right now is a dramatized audio version. So it's like listening to those old radio shows where you could hear the train in the background if the scene had a train. So this has actors acting out C.S. Lewis screw tape letters, and it's really effective. And this is what C.S. Lewis was writing to his brother about what he was thinking about at the time about this book. He said, I, it would be called as one devil to another. <laughs> That was the original title. And it would consist of letters from an elderly retired devil to a young devil who has just started to work on his first patient. <laughs> the idea would be to give all the psychology of temptation from the other point of view. And it does. And you want to know what the devil is trusting in. It says in the, in the message, I'm sorry, not the message, in the um, Passion Translation, which you hear me talk about a lot. Let's just look at it. Look at that same verse that we use through the Passion for a minute. It says, Satan belongings are undisturbed, and he stands guard over his fortress kingdom, strong and fully armed with an arsenal of many weapons. Boy, that changes it, doesn't it? He's got not just fully armed, but this says there's a fortress kingdom that the enemy was holding over me, and he had a whole arsenal of weapons that he used against me. And what Screwtape's Letters does is show you what some of those weapons are in his arsenal of how he gets us to believe lies. Because the truth sets you free, so if he can get you to believe a lie, you won't get free from the truth. Or he allows... Well, look, all of us, uh, in one way or another, have suffered some harsh, harsh treatment in our lives, I would guess, right? Very few people just get this smooth ride. And frankly, if you've had a smooth ride, you're, you're susceptible to getting taken advantage of because there's some form of needing to understand about contending to make it in the world or else you'll be taken advantage of, right? Jesus wasn't just this little flower. I mean, he flipped over the tables. When it was time to take authority over something, he did it. So we have to just reframe our thinking a little bit here, right? So what? think about it. What are some of the offenses that the enemy would use against us? What are some of the tools and weapons in his arsenal? I just wrote down a couple. And, and the first thing that I've said many times recently is that he wants to normalize sin in the culture. Because if he can normalize sin in the culture, then you being a Christian trying to take a stand, you look like the bad guy. If they can turn what is evil into good... Then, and you're just saying, no, I know, I trust the Lord. I'm reading the word of God, and I know that the thing that you're calling good is evil in God's eyes. So that's one of his main strategies. We live in a democracy, and if the law passes, we have to follow the law. But you could be a, a person who says, look, I don't agree with abortion. I'm not going to have an abortion, you could say. But that doesn't mean that other people can't because it's legal. I don't like it that it's legal, but I live in America, and I'm not moving to Russia. As bad as, you know, some things about America might be, it's still the greatest country. So it's why we need to think about elections and why we need to be thinking about getting engaged and involved in knowing what we believe because there's other things that they talked about, and I don't want to go there, but just so you know, the next year is going to be very heated around these things, and you have to be engaged with it, even though it feels a little slimy, doesn't it? The way people treat each other, the way they talk to each other, we have to rise above that and realize... This really important, this next election, whatever, they're all important. 
All right, so that's the first one, normalizing sin. Taking things in the word of God and saying, because you believe that, you hate people. See, that's, that's taking something that the Bible calls evil and saying that you're wrong. So not only do we want you to give us permission to do this, we want you to celebrate us in our sin. And, and we can't do that. And we're not condemning anybody or not judging anybody because heterosexual sin is also a sin in the Bible, right? So if you want to qualify for leadership in a church, you can't have three wives. Not in this state. Maybe in Utah, a different kind of church. I don't know. A man shall leave his mother and father and cling to his wife. Plenty. One is plenty. Okay? More than enough for me. <laughs> One husband is plenty too, right? So you get my point. I don't want to belabor it. You just have to be really careful. We have to have that Daniel anointing that he was in Babylon, but he didn't allow the culture to affect him. He said, you know what? You watch me. I'm just going to eat vegetables. And if I'm not stronger than the other men after three weeks, no problem. He was because you don't have to eat the culture stuff. It used to be the culture was promoting Christianity. But you know what? The gospel just flourished in the Roman Empire. They were not cultivating Christianity, okay? It was so good that they chose it, Amen. right? So you don't have to ever worry about losing tax-exempt status. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are going, oh, I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> See, you get it? Like, we make a big deal out of this stuff, but not a big deal to God. And by the way, it's not going to happen on our watch as Christians in America. Amen? Let's just say that. Oh, boy. So what other weapons does he have? And this kind of ties into the class that we run because what we do is just we kind of let you know what the material is about. And then we ask you to ask the Holy Spirit to say what might be unique about my background and the way I was raised and where I grew up and the family I was in and the fact that my mother or father wasn't there or maybe they died or one might have had a problem with alcohol. Or There's just a thousand scenarios that are different for each one of us here. How's that affecting me today? You know, because if you say, well, you know, the day I got saved, I became a new creation. All things have passed away and all things are, are new now. So nothing about my past could be affecting my present. We don't believe that, okay? We think that's a misreading of that verse. I'll teach on that another day, okay? But I can tell you, if you want to have a talk about it, I'm happy to talk to you. The other thing is just like Jesus said to the Pharisees, like why would Satan cast out Satan? It's just so obvious, right? So it's the same kind of thinking here is that if that were true, that the day you became a Christian, you were not subject to any kind of sin anymore because everything's new, then why is there so much of a problem of pornography in the church? In the church, does that mean they're not Christians? They're Christians, but they're struggling with something. Okay, so... What are the arsenal of weapons that the enemy can use against us? Well, there's one, pornography. Now, who's stronger, the strong man or Jesus? But how come the strong man is winning? Because in that person's life, they haven't gained victory over that addiction. And that's what it is. It's an addiction. So it's no different than any other kind of addiction that can be broken. And because Jesus is the stronger one, not only does he get you to stop doing the pornography, he'll now use you as a teacher to go help other people. So he takes that thing that the devil meant for evil, and he turns it around to use it for good. All things, the Bible says, God will make all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. And if you ever want to hear like an amazing testimony about that, listen to Joyce Meyer. And, and she was raped by her father. I can't even tell you how many times it's, it's hard to listen to what happened to her. And the Lord asked her to forgive him later, before he died. And she said, I'm a better person for going through that process. Now, that's hard to believe, isn't it? Like, you really have to watch it to really get it. It's called One Life. It's free. You can find it on YouTube. It's about 55 minutes long. Have a box of tissues nearby. But the supernatural power of God to touch somebody's life, if anybody would have ever had a reason to say he doesn't deserve to be forgiven, she could have said that. But who was being hurt by her not forgiving him? Her. <laughs> See, these unscrupulous weapons the enemy uses against us makes us think that we're better off to not forgive somebody because they owe me an apology first. He's got you locked up in his arsenal right there. 
you're holding on to bitterness and poison in your system. And have you ever met anybody who's holding a lot of resentment and bitterness? Doesn't it show on their face? I heard one teacher say, by the time we're 40, we have the face we deserve. Oh, God help us. If you smile a lot, it shows, right? If you frown a lot, it shows. Anyway, whatever. You go do what you want with that one. <laughs> I'd rather focus on the second part of this verse, which says, when one stronger than he comes to attack and overpower him, the stronger one, Jesus, empties the arsenal in which he trusted, <laughs> okay? So he loses his power over you. When Jesus comes in and becomes your victor, the enemy loses his power over you. And ideally, you never want to do that thing again. Like you get delivered from wanting to do it anymore. It doesn't happen for everybody that way. So you don't have to feel less than if it didn't, wasn't immediately taken from you. But you know that the tools are available. The Lord will give you the tools to give you victory over that situation. All right? That's, it could be different for people. But the ultimate goal is Jesus is stronger than the strong man. So no matter what I'm going through, any problem I face, he made a way out for me. If I'll dig in and, and soak myself in the word and spend time with the Holy Spirit and stop being so distracted, because that's just another tool of the enemy today, is to feed you a heavy diet of distraction and stop you from having any kind of long form learning and spending an hour reading something complex. The Bible's complex, the book of Romans, the book of Hebrews, you're not an easy read. It's not a bumper sticker. So if he can keep you distracted, you're just going to, all. Oh, I'll, I'll read a psalm. I'll read a verse. Jesus wept. I read my Bible. <laughs> See what happens? Because they spend a lot of money trying to addict you to video games and even YouTube and, and Facebook too. I'm, you know, I, I put that qualifier out there. You have to control your spirit, man. But it could still be used for good. It's really hard to get a victory if you can't even pay attention for more than 10 seconds, right? We got to be able to focus in on the Lord. So what are some of the things? I love 22. The conqueror, Jesus, will ransack the devil's kingdom and distribute all the spoils of victory. That's to you. The person that gets free not only gets free, but then gets what the devil was using as a spoil of the victory. Just like David's men, right? When they got ransacked. Their city got ransacked, and the men wanted to kill him, but they went back and, and found their stuff, and they found their wives, and they took back all the spoils of war. Not just their stuff. They got stuff that these, the enemy had taken from other people. So you are the victor, and it's not just that you stop doing a certain behavior. You now have authority to help other people with the thing that was bothering you. Joyce Meyer can talk to people who've had sexual abuse in their lives because she lived through it and got victory over it. That gives you so much authority. It's awesome, isn't it? All right, so what are some of the things that the Lord gives us on this side of the victory? What are some of the spoils that we should just meditate on and remember? And I was just really coming to tears as I was thinking about it. The first thing I'm gonna say is Holy Spirit, okay? Because it's the main difference in your life, saved versus not saved. Now, how much room you give him is up to you. But you really do need to be intentional about giving him room. A lot of men especially, we just think asking for help is a sign of weakness. And the lady said, yeah, and the men don't say amen because it's like, it is a sign of weakness. I shouldn't have to ask for help. But prayer is asking for help sometimes. And prayer is not a sign of weakness, is it? Right. So Holy Spirit is the power of God inside of you to help you keep reminding you that you shouldn't do this alone. Ask for guidance. Seek the Lord's help. If I have an idea, the first thing Trisha asked me is, did you pray about it? And what did the Lord say? That's a pretty good answer, isn't it? We should all be saying that to each other. I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but did you pray? And what did the Lord say? Oh, well, it's kind of obvious. I didn't have to bother him with this one. Don't say that. It's a problem. He's not bothered, first of all, by it. And if you're not praying, you're going to jump into some conclusions and assumptions that could be wrong. Something could look good, but not be God. So be careful. So Holy Spirit's on the top of my list. How about being forgiven? That was the spoil of war because, you know, the enemy is an accuser of the brethren. 
So he tries to put you on trial. And the odd thing is, when he accuses you of, you did it. <laughs> I did. If he put me on trial and the judge said, stand, and how do you plead, Mr. Roselli? To the charge of adultery. Back then, not today. Guilty. To the charge of possession of dangerous controlled substances. Guilty. To the charge of selling dangerous controlled substances called drug dealing. Guilty. I, I would have had to say that. It was true. But my attorney said, I paid a price for him. Whew. We get the spoils of victory, see? We get forgiveness, and we get well, what I saw this morning was that picture when the adoption papers came out, it's God's DNA that you got adopted into, and you're now a child of God. And because of that, you get a seat at his table regardless of your background. Woo. And look, it doesn't mean what you did wasn't bad. It just means he's better. <laughs> and he's willing to forgive you. You could say, why? I didn't deserve it. Because he loves you. Amen. You're right. We didn't deserve it. That's why it's called grace. But now that we're in grace, let's not be sloppy about it and just say, well, he has to forgive me so I could just live any way I want. Right? That's Paul warned us against that. So don't forget about forgiveness. Top of the list, too. Right up there with Holy Spirit. I, I got a bunch of them here. Just getting set free. I mean, one of the reasons we spend time in worship is you just have to celebrate. You have to remember that you're free. And, you know, the, care, the cares of this life could start to wear you down, but it's just so good to step into an atmosphere where people are celebrating. So, look, if you want to stay sad, come at 11.15 or something. I don't know. Because we plan on celebrating when we get together because we got a lot to be thankful for. I'm alive right there. That's enough. I told you, my cousin Vinny, when he was training me in the garbage business, he said, look, life's tough and then you die. <laughs> That's like the family motto. That's a little depressing, man. Yeah, life's tough, but I have God. That's better than then you die, you know, because then I live. <laughs> I'm going to be resurrected. Um, I'm, I'm just going to think of Isaiah 61, too. There's so many of what he says here, distributes the spoils of victory, right? Just in that one couple of first verses of Isaiah 61, I came to heal the brokenhearted and to bind up their wounds. I came to give you beauty for ashes. Ho, oh, how many had ashes? And he handed you beauty for ashes. In the Message Bible, it says a bouquet of roses for your pile of ashes. He took your death and gave you life. Oh, man, you got to stay excited about that. He gave me joy for mourning. You know, this is true in our household that I didn't realize until I got, until it was unpacked a little bit for me. I knew Trisha's mom had a very rough life, but I didn't, you know, I didn't really get to know her as well until she was living with us. And she ended up living with us for 15 years. And, you know, she was shell-shocked in some ways because she lived in, in the war, uh, in Europe during the war. And her town was bombed by the, you know, the Allies. The war was going on right in her village. German soldiers were coming in, doing horrendous things to people. And not just the German soldiers, other soldiers, too, did terrible things. So Trisha's dad was uh, in, in the U.S. Army. He was there. They met and, you know, called for her and said, come back. I want you to marry me. And she comes to America, doesn't know English, and just has to figure it all out. There was some family here. So, you know, years go by and years go by, and, and she's still a little shell-shocked when she moves in with us. She had experienced a lot of, of uh, hard things in her life. But just through the love of God, just through living in our house um, and, you know, seeing a change in Trisha, <laughs> which happened before she moved in, you know, their relationship really changed. I remember um, Linda saying to me one time, whenever their mom was mad at Trisha, she'd go to Linda and say, tell her to read that book again. <laughs> so even though her mom wasn't a Christian, she knew it was having a good effect on her daughter. <laughs> but look, man, she was a survivor to the max. This lady was one of the toughest people you'd ever want to meet. Um, so the thing is, once she came into the house, she was engulfed with love. And she was engulfed with God. And, you know, she came to us the first couple of weeks she was there, and she says, where's the bill for the phone, and how much do I have to pay on the electric bill? 
And we said, you don't have to pay anything. You live with us. You know? And she was shocked. Like, even that. You know, if you're not used to it, you, you wouldn't have just expected it. And, you know, maybe you're uncomfortable to say it. And, like, she couldn't believe the, the grace of God would be that great, you know? And it wasn't us. Who, who's going to charge your mother-in-law rent? You got to pay the phone bill? What, are you kidding me? No. There was no strings attached. We want you to live with us. What if I had to pay you to cook for us? I'd have to pay you $1,000. She's a great cook, right? But she didn't think she should be paid for that either, right? Do you see how it works? And this whole other side of her personality blossomed. That's part of the spoils. It's the spoils that, the de the, that God takes back from the devil that tried to rob. He tried to rob her joy. And the three girls are going, man, I never knew mommy had such a great sense of humor. Because <laughs> mostly growing up, she wasn't very happy. She, and it, she had reason not to be. But it's never too late. It's so awesome, right? And even with a crusty old tough guy, gets filled with the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden you see tears start coming down because the Holy Ghost is working on that inside, right? I mean, you know, I could go all day on this. I just want to go to a couple more. You go to Ephesians 4. I really could go all day, and I'm not going to. I know what time it is. But I love this. This is called the Kingdom New Testament. Uh, one of my more favorite translations. It's just not in. I'm lobbying for it to be included in Bible Gateway. <laughs> it's just not there yet. So this is what he says in Ephesians 4. When Jesus went up on high, he led bondage itself into bondage. <laughs> Whoa. We normally hear he led captivity captive, right? But it's a little harder to understand. But the very bondage the enemy was trying to use on you, Jesus arrested him and put him in jail. So he led bondage into bondage. <laughs> and he gave gifts to people. And without studying this, you might not know that Paul, who wrote this, was just quoting one of the Psalms. Okay? It's Psalm 68, 18. And I'll tell you, I had a little time under, hard time understanding this verse because I didn't really get the part of giving gifts to men. And, you know, some of the rest of it in that chapter was a little hard to understand. But here's one way of looking at it that I studied and I feel confident has merit. It's, uh, it says in verse 9, when it says that he went up, what this means is that he also came down. That's Holy Spirit. Yeah. Think about it that way. And now just go back with me to Psalm 68, which is Old Testament, right? What would people in the Old Testament have thought the psalmist was saying? One translation could be that Moses went up. And what did Moses get when he went up on the mountain? The law. And he came down and he brought them the law. So Jesus went up and what came down? Holy Spirit. See? That's Pentecost. That's what the Jews celebrate on Pentecost is Moses going up and getting the law. We celebrate day of Pentecost is Holy Spirit coming down. So isn't this a beautiful thing? He gave gifts to men. First of all, he locked up the devil and took the one who had you locked up and locked him up, distributed the spoils as gifts to men. And we all have those gifts. And, and, and what came down to the lower place where we are is the Holy Spirit. The one who came down, Holy Spirit, is the same one who went up. See, because it's the Spirit of Jesus living in us. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost is an equal part of the Godhead. So he distributed himself to all Christians all over the world. Not because we deserved it, but because he loves us. And because he does great exploits through broken vessels, doesn't he? and vessels of clay, pots of clay. We're cracked pots. <laughs> the one who came down is the same one that went up. Yes, above all things, so that he might what? Fill you and me. How many of you fill with Holy Spirit? How many want to refill? Come on, right? That's how it works. It's not just one and done. God loves you just like you love your kids, and you want them to have the best. Amen? I'm going to finish now. God, it's hard. There's so many good verses here. I'm going to go to the last, the last one, okay? It's Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. Um, the gifts, you know, you could look at another part of Ephesians 4. It's a, it said he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. How many saints we got? Everybody here? You can qualify as a saint. How many would like to be equipped? All of us would like to be equipped because it's, it's so meaningful. I'm, I'm actually writing a chapter in a book right now for Doris Wagner, who's Peter Wagner's wife, 87 years old, still going out and speaking at conferences. <laughs> Toughest lady other than Trisha's mom. 
toughest lady I've ever met. Never complains. Incredible. And the, and the, the title of the chapter is called Finishing Strong. Because that, that was the book her husband was working on. Peter Wagner he wrote 75 books. This was going to be his 76th book. And he died in the middle of writing that book. So she decided to finish it. And she asked me to write the chapter on Finishing Strong. Well, he wrote a booklet when he was 80 called My Fourth Career. <laughs> oh, isn't that awesome? So I mean, that should give you hope as a Christian that if, if you're 60, you're hitting your best days. Like you, you're not slowing down. You're wiser. You're like good wine. You get better with age. You're much wiser, unlike cheese, which starts to stink with age. But we're like good wine. Amen? You believe it? So there's these gifts and for the equipping of the saints. And how many know at 60, you might have a lot more wisdom than you had at 20? So maybe you've learned a few things over those 40 years. And you can put them into practice. So you don't have to retire as a Christian. Peter Wagner, Doris Wagner, like I said, 87. She's still traveling around the country doing conferences, teaching at conferences. She's had a leg amputated. She's in a wheelchair. She doesn't care. She's going to advance the kingdom until her last breath. Her husband, I saw him two weeks before he died in the hospital, and you could tell, you know, he didn't have long to go. John Price was telling jokes. He was laughing, you know, like, just a funny guy. And... Um, as we were leaving, John was crying because he said, you know, I don't know if I'm ever going to see you again because I have to go back to Jersey. And he knew I was staying another day. And he looked at me and he said, uh, when you come back tomorrow, I want you to give me a summary of what they talk about at the meeting tonight. <laughs> I'm telling you, he never stopped learning. He didn't want to stop learning. He thought he was going to get healed and get back on his feet and get out of that hospital. And why wouldn't you? What's the harm? You don't have to give up. Just believe God. He's a miracle-working God. You'll never have to be depressed. Now, look, if you are, it doesn't mean you don't have a reason to be, but God will break you out of that thing. That's why we sang it so many times, breakthrough, breakthrough this morning. So I'm just going to stand. have you stand, and we'll finish reading this together so you don't get too discouraged about how late it is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I cut out about seven slides, so I'm really, this is good for me. <laughs> Again, this is Passion Translation, okay? So it's just rich. I really like it. So I encourage you to read it. It's Ephesians chapter 3, and we'll read it out loud together. Ready? I pray that he would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory. And f Now, just do me a favor. Can you look at another person while you say that? I'll, I'll say it, and then you repeat it. Because I wanted you to say that you're praying this over somebody. And I pray... That he would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor. Now, let me just ask you, do you believe that? Do you like the person you're speaking to? Because even if you don't like them, it would be good if this happens. See? So either way, you win. <laughs> All right. Now, here we go. Keep repeating. Look at the person. Until supernatural strength floods your innermost being with his divine might and explosive power. <laughs> then, by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside you. <sighs> this is the best part right here. You ready? Drum roll, please. Look at that person. And the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's lift our hands. Thank you, Lord, for the richness of your word. Thank you that it nourishes our hearts. Let this last part be so true that you would release that, that life of Christ deep inside of us and that the resting place of your love 
will become the very source and root of our lives today, Father. We're so grateful for the relationship that you have and that you're not distant and far away and shut down and closed for business. You never slumber or sleep. You're always there for us, Lord. Anybody here who's discouraged today, we ask you to break off that discouragement off their lives. Give them hope again in place of hopelessness. Give them the beauty that you have for ashes and that joy for mourning, Lord. We ask you to do the great exchange in all of our lives, not for our glory, but for your glory, that we might be weapons in your hand, equipped saints that are about the Father's business. We want to be like Jesus who said, my meat is to do the will of the one who sent me. And as the Father has sent me, Jesus said, so I send you. So be sent out of here today with the joy of the Lord. Amen. Love you all. Prayer, prayer, right? Yes, we have prayer today. So look, if you're one of those people that came in a little discouraged, you need a shot of adrenaline from Jesus. Come on up for prayer. We're going to have the prayer ministry team right up here. I'll give you the other seven slides next week. <laughs>